I'm you're really glad to be here and thank you very much Ted for all of your warm words and I really hope that everybody will go out of this session having identified at least one action you can take to transform fragility into anti-fragility whether it's in your organization or for your clients and for those who haven't met the word anti-fragility yet it's the end stage after resilience or robustness anti-fragility means that whenever you hit conflict or stress you or your organization actually goes grows stronger and more capable of doing what you're there to do i'll cover in the next half an hour why and how it's important to legally incorporate in ways that can give you the best possible sociocratic organization and in particular ted and paul atkins set the stage perfectly for me because this is about how do you really bring to life everything that they were talking about around eleanor ostrom's comments so i'll be describing deeper in what i call the fair shares commons company it's an incorporated commons so how did i get to where i am and what i'm doing now my life has been filled all the time with two questions why am i getting the results i'm getting and why is the world the way it is so logically with that start i moved into theoretical physics people were much more too difficult for me to deal with then i thought well maybe business is the place for me and i spent 10 years as a manager with procter and gamble 12 years ago it became clear to me that the climate emergency the 17 sdgs were coming way faster and way bigger than most people were seeing and i couldn't see any way of dealing with this within standard corporate life so i left png focusing on what can i do and still asking the questions why am i getting the results i'm getting why is the world the way it is and in particular why is business so weak and fragile why is our economy so weak and fragile when you look at the big picture so i began diving into sociocracy holacracy the art of hosting otto lasker's work on adult and organizational development and much more meeting sociocracy and i use the term by the way to refer refer to all flavors I thought at first this was the solution to all of the root causes of the problems we were facing that this would create anti-fragile businesses and an economy that really worked for people and planet i applied various flavors including holacracy to my startups one of them was a renewable energy company a think tank a learning and development consultancy and in each case in those three it didn't work I came to the conclusion that sociocracy alone cannot even make the company resilient, let alone anti-fragile. So it was back to the question, why am I getting the results I'm getting? Why is the world the way it is? Why is business so fragile? Why is our economy so um, fragile? So if you're not on speak of you yet, please shift to speak of you now because I am shifting over to this. The conclusion I came to is that there are four strata in every business, the lower four strata, and each of them can be fragile. The if any of them is fragile, then the whole is fragile. And if the lower four strata within each business is fragile, then you're going to have fragile local economies and a fragile global economy, one that simply cannot do the job we need it to do. Now, this fragility affects many domains. For example, I'll argue that no business that is owned as property can ever have real psychological safety. So if you have anything other than a free company or a fair shares commons at level four 
you do not have psychological safety as an individual, nor as a team, nor do you have really the capacity to safely implement sociocracy or holacracy or any of those. This means that if we truly want to address the climate emergency at a global level, create local communities that work with local businesses that work, we have to turn the fragilities in each of these into anti-fragilities. So the way to do that, the, the conclusion I've come to is level four, it has to be a free company or a fair shares commons. Level three, sociocracy is a brilliant way of doing it, can't fault that. Level two and level one, We've integrated things like the art of hosting, developmental processes like immunity to change, Otto Lasker's work, nonviolent communication into a collection of patterns that you can use to generate anti-fragility there, to turn the tension and the conflict within each person between people into the direction, the energy, and the resource for growth. The red thread uniting all of these processes at the first four levels is they bring in all kinds of tension and conflict between all of the relevant entities at each level. They bring them into the tent, make them all visible and safe so that you can harness tension and conflict to grow stronger, to create anti-fragility. And the end benefit is that individual human energies are multiplied and released for productive results rather than being lost either in unproductive defense or simply because they're not volunteered. You know, we know how powerful sociocracy is at level three, the roles and tasks level, to get this done. It does a superb job of harnessing lost energy and bringing it into work. It can be very exposed to level four fragilities. And just as a short story, a friend of mine used to run a company, a consultancy in the US. They were actually running on holacracy, but same kind of thing. And everybody realized just how fragile everything was when they arrived at work one Monday morning to discover that the founder who owned the dominant shareholding of the company had decided without telling anybody over the weekend to sell the company to a private equity house. And the first thing that the private equity company did on Monday morning was rip out holacracy, bring in a completely new executive team and impose a traditional vertical hierarchy into the organization. You know, that was the point they realized that if you're doing sociocracy or holacracy in a company that is owned, that is deemed property, where a narrow group of people has the power to sell it, you're actually all the property of the owner. You, and things can happen without consent. Yeah. And that story was that I heard oof, something like eight years ago now was one of the final things that convinced me we really have to do a significantly better job here at level four. Sociocracy can't do it. NVC can't do it if you have any fragilities left here. All four strata must be anti-fragile. So how do we do that? I'll go into the next picture in a moment. In this one, there are three axes we need to look at. The, both of these, stratum one inside me and stratum two between us, form one axis here, the human axis. The other axis is the roles task and incorporation. So what we need to do is to create companies, and I'll disappear off the side for a moment, just my head in place where we have in this axis, the roles tasks, 
that we're at least at level three, entry level sociocracy or even better level four. You know, that's where we're all trying to get to. But what we've realized is that if you try to do that faster than the developmental human axis can support or the incorporation axis can support, this axis is fragile. So what we've found works really well with ourselves and with the clients we're working in is to take them along the developmental axis at least as fast as we're taking them along the axis towards sociocracy. And ideally, you know, most of my work now is with startups when they're being incorporated. And there I have the luxury of incorporating them from day one as a fair shares commons. And if you're incorporated as a fair shares commons, the other two axes are so much easier. If not, you know, at least be incorporated as a cooperative because level one or level zero, the two flavors of normal limited companies, they bring so much psychological danger and fragility with them. So level th three is a multi-stakeholder cooperative. That's a really good place to be, at least be level two, a standard cooperative. Even better level four, fair shares cooperative, which I'll touch on briefly. But the best is level five, the free company or the fair shares commons. So what does all of that mean? Um, yeah, let me tell you another story. Why do we need free companies to do sociocracy well, to create circular economies and regenerative economies. Well, I grew up in apartheid South Africa, an inherently fragile system. The basis of apartheid is very simple. If you were lucky enough to be born with a white skin, as I was, you had the voting power to engage in steering the company into the future and the lion's share of the wealth generated in the economy. It struck me 10 years ago, as I was thinking of the limited company, in the limited company, if you happen to have enough money to invest, you get all of the voting power to engage in steering the company into the future and the lion's share of the wealth generated by the business. Smells the same to me. Apartheid, begins with a very simple DNA. And all of the fragilities, injustices, and evils of apartheid emerge from that simple DNA. And the DNA is separation of different parts of the system so that they can no longer function together as a whole. That's what the word apartheid means. It comes from the Dutch or the Afrikaans. Apart is the same as the English word apart. And hate is best translated as a context or a state. Apartheid is simply a state of separation. So the first fundamental fragility in the first three levels of incorporation, so zero, one, two, and three, is separating the stakeholders from each other. This excludes most of the stakeholders from corporate governance and it excludes most of them from any share of the wealth generated. Even worse, it means that in effect, we're treating companies the same way that we used to treat slaves. I'll come back to that in a moment. The consequence of this is that we shut down the value that most of the stakeholders can bring to the organization from the tensions they're experiencing and the energy they could contribute to creating anti-fragility in the organization and the ecosystem as a whole. The second fundamental fragility in conventional forms of incorporation is treating the company as property. And as I said, this is analogous to treating human beings as property. And if you think back to my story of my friend's consultancy in the US, if I sell a company today, the buyer is buying all of the people and all of their relationships with each other. Earlier, we heard about various forms of 
hierarchical power. If somebody doesn't have the freedom to go somewhere else, that is the most extreme form of imposed power and consent cannot really work at its full effectiveness in that. Not everybody has the luxury of being able to simply leave the company they're in and go to another company that is fundamentally different. The best most of us can do is go to another company that is fundamentally the same or leave the normal world of employment completely and become a coach, a yoga teacher, or a sociocracy consultant. Um, and so that means most of us actually don't have the power to leave this apartheid-like situation where we can be bought or sold at the whim of the investing shareholders. Now this fragility is still present at the level free three companies, the multi-stakeholder co-ops, the B Corps, the purpose type of companies, even some self-owning or steward companies still have this fragility in them, even though they do so much better than the level zero or level one companies. Even the level four company, the vanilla fair shares company still has this fragility, even though it includes all of the benefits of all of the different flavors of level three companies. And so to address this, we developed the Fair Shares Commons, a company that is truly fully free, fully multi-stakeholder and satisfies Eleanor Ostrom's basis for the commons. Now we're truly able to harness all of the tensions between all of the stakeholders to have an anti-fragile incorporation rather than just a more fragile incorporation. Now, the biggest benefit you get from having the Fair Shares Commons is a very deep long-term trust across all of the stakeholders. You have an extraordinarily powerful way of harnessing the value and the energy in any of the tensions that any stakeholder is experiencing in relationship to the needs and interests and perspectives of any other stakeholder. So you now bring all of the conflict, all of the tension into the company and you can really harness it to create anti-fragility. This means that you can really bring the full power of consent decision-making all the way up into the general meetings that steer the company into the long-term future, all the way into the boardroom, everything is truly representative of the whole within the company and the elements of society that the company is interacting with and depending on. So how does the Fair Shares Commons work? The first thing to do is to identify what the company as a whole is there for. Why does it exist? What does it need to enable? And what does it need to protect? From that, you start looking and identifying the primary types of stakeholders that are part of the company being a healthy, thriving, living being which kind of capital does each invest? Financial, human, intellectual relationship, etc. And what kind of return do they need on that capital? And this can then leads you to identifying, say, a number of stakeholders that might be in your company. You might have staff, you might have suppliers, you might have investors, you might have customers. The Fair Shares Commons will always have stewards, and I'll say a bit about that later. You might even have cities as invest or as stakeholders. You might have the nation state as a stakeholder. All of these can come in. So once you've identified all of the stakeholders, a core part of how it works is it, it's bringing in the best 
of the cooperative, of the limited company, of the foundation or the trust into one. So like a cooperative, each member in each stakeholder group has one vote per person in a general meeting. However, the vote is weighted group by group, keeping some of the benefits of a limited company and creating an equitable sociocratic balance in general meeting level legal decisions. This means that you have neither the fragility of the limited company where the opinion with the most money behind it wins, nor the fragility of the standard cooperative where the opinion with the most people wins. You know, again, it removes this possibility of an opinion being imposed without consent all the way through into the legal foundation. The next step is to build into the constitution the principles of the commons and whatever else is necessary for the company to truly do the job it's there to do at a legal level to enable what it needs to enable and to protect what it needs to protect. You, know, you can think of the company in relationship to a commons in somewhat the same way as in a land commons a few hundred years ago, the company plays the role of the castle and the knights. They're there to protect the commons against enemy action. And today we have company law, accountants and lawyers, and all we need to do is take existing company law, which is perfect for this, and harness them as our castles and knights to protect the very things we're talking about. To do that well, what we need to do is make sure that we anchor into the constitution of the fair shares commons, the principles of the commons, and especially we need to reduce as close to zero as is legally possible in your jurisdiction or possibilities of selling the company. The steward stakeholder class are fundamental in protecting the company against any attempt to make it property that can be sold. And then we need to add in freedom, the principles, the processes and the structures that enable the company, as Frederick Leloux says, to truly have and grow into its own evolutionary purpose, independent of any specific opinion of one powerful person. One of the things that we strongly recommend as well is that all major decisions need to consider the needs of the next seven generations. So when we facilitate a decision through consent in a general meeting, we will have people speaking on behalf of the next seven generations as well, not just the needs of the next quarter. I mentioned the stewards as critical. In many ways, the stewards play the role of grandparents or the elders of a village that have been part of so many highly functional commons in the past. And to preserve the company as a free commons, the stewards are also held accountable to vote according to the principles of stewardship enshrined in the constitution of the company. Another big thing that makes this work is just like any commons, wealth is shared equitably between everybody. So each year the surplus wealth generated is shared amongst all stakeholders, not just investors. So where does this end up? Earlier, Emanuele talked about how, what is the paradigm for how we see the human being and the organization behind this. What this is doing, the, the four levels here, the paradigm behind all of this is looking at the company as a living, meaning-making, sentient, perhaps even spiritual being, just as you or I are, 
and that we need to make sure that the way we treat the company legally is exactly the same as the way we treat ourselves legally as free legal persons the company must also be a free legal person and if we do that then all three of these levels here plus level four give the company and all of the people in it and all the people related in to it the full capacity to show up as living beings fully capable of meaning making and charting their own course through life it means that the company does not have to live forever it lives as long as is right for that kind of living being and it means that the people involved each human being is one of the individual cells of that incorporated larger living being and it means each of us can show up fully as our unique selves we don't have to hide we don't have to pretend to be somebody else and we're all part of this common whole we're all showing up speaking and acting as guardians of this larger living being that we are part of in a way we're in loco parentis so i'm coming up to the end of my speaking time if you want to know more about it you are welcome to track down this book google it download it and read it it describes everything i've been talking about and lots more all the way from how do we reinvent the global economy through to the level the stratum one of how do we develop ourselves all that's missing is the final round of editing which we hope to get done in the next um, month and then evolute six books the first fair shares commons publishing company will publish the book